University band director Albert Perfect and student John DeWitt Gilbert, the assistant editor of the Emerald, met to decide if combining Perfect's music with Gilbert's lyrics would make a suitable school fight song. The result was, and still is, Mighty Oregon. Good. Well, I guess the next step is for you and the band to present it to the, the student body to see if they'll accept it. Would they better? We certainly can't keep using On Wisconsin forever. I guess they're going to punt again. As Beckett back to do the kicking, here's the snap back, and the ball goes to Beckett. He gets the kick away down to the Pennsylvania 14-yard line. Uh, Howard Berry gathers it in, and Berry begins to run. He gets, and he puts the ball. He puts it way back to the uh, web foot 39 to Shai Huntington, and Huntington cuts up across midfield, down to the 45, down to the 43 before he's running the bound. Two punts on the same play. Well, things have changed since January 1st, 1917, when the Oregon Wetfoots, the Pacific Coast champions of the West, met the Pennsylvania Quakers, champions of the East. In the third Rose Bowl ever played, underdog Oregon upset Penn 14-0. It's interesting for me, having been a history major and football player at Oregon, to notice how the program has changed over the years. The Ducks began playing in 1894, 22 years before band director Albert Perfect and assistant editor of the Emerald, John DeWitt Gilbert, collaborated on Mighty Oregon. In 1904, they moved to Kincaid Field, located near Chapman Hall. In 1919, Hayward Field was built, named after Bill Hayward, the track coach and head trainer from 1903 to 1947. And in 1967, Austin Stadium replaced Hayward Field as the football home of the Ducks. The team's original name was the Webfoots. Sports writers began calling them the Ducks to save copy space, and Ducks became the common usage, especially after 1947, when Walt Disney granted the university rights to use the Donald Duck logo. Of course, it's not names and places, but seeing those great games, plays, and players that make Oregon football exciting. He was probably one of the toughest players I've ever played with. Uh, he took tremendous beating week after week. This certainly had to be the most exciting football game I've ever seen or ever have been around. In my mind, clearly, he is the one above all others. We'll find out who and what they were talking about. But first, let's look at how he went to the Rose Bowl twice by 1920. Football began at the University of Oregon in 1894, 25 years after the first college game between Rutgers and Princeton and 18 years after the university was founded in 1876. Cal Young was Oregon's first coach, and in their first game, the Ducks trounced Albany College 44-2. In 1910, the rule specified that the passer had to be five yards behind the line of scrimmage to throw a pass, and it stayed that way until 1945. The ball was a little larger in the middle, as you can see from this 1910 game ball. Chuck Taylor scored 10 touchdowns against Puget Sound in a 114 to nothing slaughter. Taylor was the first player west of the Mississippi to get All-American mention by Walter Kemp. 1913 marked the return of Hugo Bezdek for a five-year stay. Of all the Oregon coaches that were here five years or more, Bezdek is the only one that never had a losing season. Bezdek's quarterback from 1914 to 1916 was Charles Shy Huntington. Possessing a stocky frame and a cool head, the Dallas Oregon product was Oregon's first, first-team All-American. Huntington had this to say about Coach Bezdek. Our Coach Bezdek used to say, give me a bunch of boys that can block and I'll show you an offense. Give me a bunch of boys that will tackle and I'll show you a defense. And today the fundamentals haven't changed any. 
Bezdek was said to have a giant team with a line averaging 185 pounds. The Ducks earned a trip to the 1917 Rose Bowl, but had to face the Pennsylvania Quakers, who boasted three All-Americans. Heine Miller, Walter Berry, and Bert Gold Bell, who drove around Philadelphia in a Cadillac and later became commissioner of the NFL. Captain John Beckett said, we were scared to death of them, but the Ducks played a great game, being in better condition and hitting the Quakers harder. Penn's coach was stunned by the 14-0 outcome, but praised the Ducks to the press, saying Oregon had a great team and deserved to win. In 1918, Chai Huntington took over as coach. Stanford was added to the PCC, and by 1919, the Ducks were on the road back to Pasadena. Quarterback Bill Steers led the Ducks from 1917 to 1920 and was all coast three years. In the 1920 Rose Bowl, Oregon faced Harvard. Oregon ran up more yards and first downs than Harvard, but lost a heartbreaker 7-6. Trainer Bill Hayward stole the show before the game, though. Hayward told the L.A. press that he wouldn't allow his players to drink Southern California water, and that he would bring Oregon water with him on the train. The L.A. press made such a big deal about it that local residents would come to the hotel where the Ducks were staying and ask for Oregon water. Of course, Hayward hadn't brought any, but served them bottles of their own water without them knowing it. Hayward Field, built in 1919, was not only named after a great athletic trainer and track coach, but a real character. In 1920, for the first time, a crowd of over 10,000 saw Oregon play OAC. In 1923, Huntington had his only losing season at 3-4-1 and, and reluctantly stepped down as coach due to lack of alumni support. Shy Huntington was a very intelligent, basically was sound in football and his rules and regulations and training. He was tops. He was well liked by all his players and they really thought the world of him. Hal Chapman was an all-coast quarterback in 1923. From 1928 to 1930, Oregon was paced by all-coast quarterback Johnny Kitzmiller the Flying Dutchman. The 165-pound back was very versatile, running, passing, pass receiving, kicking, and punting. Bill Bowerman, who played end and slot back in 1930 to 1932, remembers Kitzmiller. Kitzmiller was a, was a senior when I was a sophomore, and he was a great running back and, and a great uh, field general. He was a coach uh, of the backfield uh, my senior year. So I had an opportunity to play with him and to play under him as a, as a backfield coach. In 1931, the old Oregon magazine consulted ex-players and coaches and came up with their all-star, all-time Oregon team through 1930. Here is the 11-man first team. At center, George Hugh, described as a swashbuckling type of old-style player. Fred Molin was at one guard and for a while held the world record for the longest field goal at 53 yards. At the other guard was Floyd Shields, one of four outstanding Shields linemen to play at Oregon in the 20s. John Beckett, at 6'1 and 185 pounds, was probably the toughest lineman up to that time that Oregon ever had. He was elected into the National Football Foundation Hall of Fame. Lewis Pinkham was described by Pat MacArthur, the father of Oregon athletics, as the best tackle ever seen on a Northwest team. At ends were Brick Mitchell and Lloyd Taggart, 1917 Rose Bowl teammates. Mitchell was hailed as one of the best tacklers in the nation after the Rose Bowl game, and Taggart caught a touchdown pass in that game. Kitzmiller was the quarterback. Parsons was one halfback and Bill Steers the other. Steers averaged 50 yards of punt in some games and once kicked the ball from his own end zone to the other end zone. The fullback was Dick Smith, who after four years at Oregon, went to play at Columbia and from there was selected as an All-American. The 30s began with a new coach, Clarence Doc Spears, who left a 28-3-9 program at Minnesota for the Ducks. Spears didn't disappoint as the Kitzmiller-led Ducks went 6-2, and two, including an impressive victory over powerhouse Drake at Soldiers Field in Chicago. In 1931, Joe Lillard, Oregon's third black player and the second black player ever to play pro football, led Oregon's Midnight Express backfield. 
Another star of the 1931 team was George Christensen, a tackle who became Oregon's second first-team All-American. Spears left after 1931, and Prince G. Callison, who had been freshman coach, took over then. Spears uh, was going to show someone how to, how to block me, and I brought my forearm up in his face, and, it, and he screamed like a wounded bull and chased me around the field. I think he'd have probably killed But he was a mean, self-centered SOB. I didn't like Spears. I, he, as he, he, I didn't like him as a person. I didn't like him as a coach. I adored Prince Callison. I liked the assistant coaches that they had. But my personality didn't match up with Spears at any time. In Prink's six years, the Ducks won six or more games four times, and Oregon produced two more All-Americans. Prink was a, a really a fine man, a great tactician, really he was. He was a great tactician. He had a fine line coach by the name of Gene Shields, who was with us for a number of years, and Prink was an innovator. Our coach, uh, Prink uh, Callison, developed an end-around play, and I made a lot of yardage on that that season and scored three touchdowns against our opponents. <laughs> Here are the 1932 Ducks in action against SC. The Ducks are in the light colored uniforms. Iron Mike Nicolet up the middle to the 10, to the 15, to the 20, putting it hold of the 25. Brooks attacking at the 30, cuts outside at the 35, to the 40, one man to beat. He's run out of bounds at the 47. Homer Griffith gets the snap, rolling to his right. Good pressure by the Webfoots. Under the heavy rush, he throws deep. Bill Bowerman on the coverage, but the pass is caught at the eight-yard line. LSU coach Bill Jones called the 200-pound Mikulak the roughest, toughest, and best all-around fullback he'd ever seen. Great offensive fullback with what was called the cruncher play. That was uh, tabbed by old L.H. Gregory, the former sports editor of the or Portland Oregonian. What was the cruncher play? Well, it was uh, the ability for Mikulak to make his own interference if it wasn't there. And it was the position that he ran, tremendously powerful thighs that were like pistons going at an angle where he was never off balance. The 1933 team went 9-1 and shared the PCC championship with USC, who had beaten the Ducks. The Ducks beat St. Mary's, the Notre Dame of the West, for the first time. Here are Mikulak and Morse blocking against USC. Mikulak and Morse both had good pro careers. I made all pro in 1935 as the fullback, and uh, people at that time referred to me as the original middle linebacker. In college football, we didn't throw more than four or five passes. In pro ball, it was six or seven. It wasn't until my third year when a Sammy Ball came out of Texas, played for the Washington Redskins, and he threw in one game the unheard of 32 passes or thereabouts. We thought that was tremendous. In the mid-30s, the Oregon-Washington rivalry really heated up. Washington had been beaten by Oregon six straight years, and uh, they winning of course upset the Oregon fans and there's always a lot of Washington fans come to the games down here and uh, first thing you knew uh, we left the stadium it was at Multnomah Field and uh, we were sitting up on the steps and we start, saw the fight start and both teams sat up there and watched it and it went on for a period of probably an hour and many broken heads and <laughs> teeth and whatnot and the but finally, the uh, Washington guys got the goalpost down. That's what created the fight. They came out to tear the goalpost down. Six foot, one inch, 200 pound, all coast tackle, Del Bjork, remembers playing Washington in 1936. I was able to uh, uh, drive their plays back uh, better than usual, and I did block one punt. And I think that was the only punt for three years that the Washington kicker uh, had blocked. In 1937, Coach Callison's last season, the Ducks beat Stanford for the first time and scored two long touchdowns versus USC. Steve Anderson, back to pass, steps up, throws into the right flat. The defender falls down. Ted Gebhardt wide open at the 30, up the right sideline to the 45. The midfield, one man to beat. Needs a block and gets a great block at the 30. Down the right sideline, 25-20. He'll go all the way, 72-yard touchdown. The snap to Jay Grabeel. 
Hands it off to Bob Schmidt. The southpaw rolling to his left, looks back to his right, has a man open, and it's Grayfield. He's open at the five-yard line, makes the catch, touchdown! Tex Oliver, whose Arizona team handed Callison his last loss at Oregon, took over in 1938. Speedy J. Graybill from Pendleton was an all-around performer for the Ducks from 1937 to 1939. Here, Graybill intercepts a pass against Cal. After the Cal game, the Ducks were ranked number six nationally. But Gonzaga's upset win and a loss to UCLA, sparked by Jackie Robinson, ruined the Ducks' promising season. The Ducks also faltered at the end of the season against the Beavers. Here, Bob Olson runs a kickoff back 92 yards. One of Oregon's scores came on this pass from Graybill to Dick Horn. In Oliver's six years, the Ducks had three 500 seasons, but no winning records. In the 30s, there was one record-breaking play. In 1938, against Idaho, halfback Bob Smith took a handoff on the eight-yard line and ran 92 yards. In 1939, Smith was the first winner of the Hoffman Award, given each year to the outstanding player by team vote. I enjoyed um, hitting people. We just played rough, tough football. This is DJ, bringing you Oregon's greatest hits of all times. UCLA at its 43-yard line. The snap to Jackie Robinson. Jackie to pass. Now he scrambles out of the pocket to the left. Needs a block. He's at the 45-yard line. Run out of bounds at the 48. Although future Major League Baseball Hall of Famer Jackie Robinson was impressive, the Ducks shut out UCLA 18 to nothing. The T formation came into being in 1945 as the rules changed to allow passing anywhere behind the line of scrimmage. After World War II, Tex Oliver returned to coach the 1945 Ducks, whose star was a 159-pound running back with 9-6 speed. As a sophomore, Jake Light became Oregon's fifth All-American. Well, it was kind of a surprise to me because I, or the team we had in 45 was, we didn't have the talent in the line at all. Light's choice was no surprise to opponents, as he intercepted 10 passes and returned them for 202 yards, still a school record today. Oliver was running the offense, and uh, he had no, no uh, fancy stuff or anything like that. The depressed Ducks recruited an experienced coach with an outstanding track record. Uh, Aiken brought in a system and uh, which was pretty well regimented and pretty well organized. Our practices were better organized than Tex Oliver. In 1947, Aiken came to Eugene and brought with him a new system, and he chose a third-string quarterback to run it for him. Well, actually, Norm Van Brocklin came to Oregon as a third-string quarterback with uh, Bob Owis and George Bell out of Walnut Creek, California. And he played third-string on a single-wing formation under Tex Oliver. And uh, when Jim Aiken came and put in the T formation, uh, Norm Van Balken had such talent that he was immediately the, the starting quarterback. He was a lousy tailback. He wasn't a tough guy. 
Uh, I could run backwards faster than he could run forward. But Norm Van Brocken had a tenacity about him that uh, he's a leader. He was a leader. The 1947 Ducks, with Van Brocklin at the helm, finished 7-3, and three, second in the conference to USC. Light was the team's top ground gator and most valuable player. We got the most penalties that year with Van. He's always after the officials and telling them, or if somebody tackled him a little bit hard. In one game, he only got tackled one time, and he was mad at us. And, uh, and he, he challenged these guys on the field and everything else, and we get penalized all the time. Van Rocken uh, gave me the business as he balled me out because uh, we blew a play together. He called the play, and I went one way, and he left holding the ball, and they jumped on him, the other team, and they kind of squashed him. He got mad and called me a lot of names and everything like that, and, and that was before halftime. And when we went in the dressing room, uh, Jim Akins, boy, he ate him out. He told him that he was the boss, he ran the show, and if he had anything to say to the players, he had to come through him. And after that time, Van would never did raise hell with me anymore after that. I probably didn't make any mistakes either. <laughs> Lewis, a highly touted running back from Los Angeles City College, came to Oregon to fill Light's shoes. And um, uh, they told me that there was a left halfback spot that was open at Oregon. And if I, if I would come to Oregon, that was my job. But when I get up there, they got 14 others trying out for the, <laughs> that one spot. <laughs> Lewis ended up sharing left halfback with another of Aiken's prized recruits, Johnny McKay, a transfer from Purdue. Well, I thought Jim was one of the best teachers of football that I've ever been around in my uh, varied career. And uh, I think the biggest thing about Jim is he's the only guy I've ever seen have a, uh, a car that was shifting gears that he just refused to shift him. He just stayed in one gear no matter what he was doing. In 1948, Aiken had the Ducks in one gear, and that was Rose Bowl. Unlike many coaches, Aiken encouraged his team and the fans to catch Rose Bowl fever. Preparing for the 1948 season, Aiken's talent-laden team had just one missing position to fill. I was playing in football, and uh, Coach Jim Aiken grabbed me by the collar and said, you're going to catch Norm Van Brocken's passes next year and be our right end. And I said, no, I'm not. I drink beer in the spring, <laughs> and I'm not going to practice <laughs> football. Uh, nevertheless, I did. Cal and Oregon were the preseason favorites, and the national media considered Van Brocklin to be the nation's best quarterback. True to form, Van Brocklin said he didn't care if he didn't make all backyard as long as we win those ball games. And win they did, as the Webfoots went 7-0 and in the conference and lost only one game all season. Oregon's record was 7-0, and and Cal's was 6-0. and the problem was that they never played each other. So Oregon challenged Cal to a playoff game and offered to meet them for the showdown in Berkeley. Conference okayed it, but Cal wouldn't do it. So the conference put it to a vote to decide the Rose Bowl team, and Cal got more votes. Of course, we thought we deserved to go, uh, playing a very, very close game with the national championships and winning all other games. But it came to a vote, and we were told that the University of Washington had voted against us. I know there were hard feelings for a long time after that. I was very disappointed that we didn't go to the Rose Bowl, but I was just delighted that the conference saw fit to, to uh, overcome some of the rules that they had stipulated and allowed us to go to the Southwest Conference to play uh, SMU in the Cotton Bowl. 70,000 fans gathered in Dallas, Texas, New Year's Day in 1949 to see Oregon tangle with SMU. The Mustangs were led in the first quarter by the running of future New York Giant great Kyle Roach and All-American quarterback Doak Walker. Walker scored the first touchdown of the game and also got off this 79-yard punt from the line of scrimmage. Bob Sanders ripped off some big yardage up the middle as the half ended with SMU leading 7-0. The Mustangs made it 14-0 in the third quarter as Kyle Rote ran for 36 yards. But the Oregon Webfoots came back in the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter now, Norm Van Brocklin heaves to the end zone, caught by Dick Wilkins for an Oregon touchdown. The conversion is no good, and SMU's lead is now 14-6. The Bomber, back to fire, sees his man. Throws a looping pass, complete to Darrell Robinson on the Mustang 20. Behind 21 to 6, George Bell just missed the Mustang goal line. Oregon onto the line of scrimmage again. Ben Brocklin back, 
Hands off to Bob Sanders. He is in there for the touchdown. That's the way it ends. Brad Eklund won all Coast honors for the second time and was named the team's most valuable player. Van Brocklin became Oregon's sixth All-American. SMU game with about a minute to play. I ran a pattern and unfortunately got the knee in the groin and came back to the huddle and Van Brocklin called a long pattern for me and I said, Norm, I can't make it. And he said, okay, damn it, I'll run the pattern and you throw the bleep football to me. And that's an example of the guy. The 1949 team still had a lot of talent, but finished four and six. Bob Sanders was the leading rusher, and George Bell continued to run hard. Two Oregon records were also set in 1949. That was really, really a great run, it was because it's 92 yards, it was the, the field was wet, and, and they took a couple of passes at me two or three ways, and I dodged to the right and flipped to the left, and, Next thing you know, it was a foot race. And that's the reason why you need a little speed when you're playing this game. It really helps. <laughs> but uh, running back punts and, and kickoffs is that one of the big things that you have to do is to take a burst of speed, get to a point as quick as you can, and then and look for an opening. Because if the guys are blocking, all you need, usually all you need is one or two blocks. Colorado kicking off. Woodley Lewis standing back in his own end zone. A high end over end kick. Woodley about two yards deep. Bobbles the ball, gathers it in, and now heads straight up the middle to the 10, to the 15, to the 20. Good hole for Lewis. Cuts outside. He has a chance to go all the way. In fact, no one's going to catch him. Woodley Lewis, 45-40. He's going to go 102 yards. A record-setting touchdown on the kickoff return for Woodley Lewis. Aiken left in 1951 amid rumors of overzealous recruiting practices. He was replaced by a coach who, in 1950, led Santa Clara to an upset victory over Kentucky in the Orange Bowl. The losing coach was Paul Bear Bryant. The winner was Len Casanova. Kaz's first coaching staff was made up of Gene Harlow, Jack Roach, and John McKay. Despite the poor 1950 season, the Ducks still landed All-State quarterback George Shaw from Grant High in Portland. As a freshman, Shaw, playing safety and part-time quarterback, set an NCAA record for 13 interceptions. It's still an Oregon record. Shaw made a brilliant one-handed interception against Washington, but the game was one of assistant coach John McKay's worst football memories. And we scored to go ahead six to nothing, and Washington promptly came back and beat us 63 to six. And I'll never forget that game uh, to the day I die because Kaz was such a great guy, and they had promised my wife a birthday party, and we went down to a nightclub there. And uh, we had a real good time uh, despite the score. But that game has stuck with, with me, and every time I have played Washington since, it's stuck with me. From the Bruin 38-yard line, a slot to the right. Shaw in motion from right to left. Hal Dunham back to throw. Has plenty of time. Rifles one down the left sideline. Shaw open. Touchdown! In 1952, Emory Barnes was selected all-coast. A key factor in the choice being the rave reviews UCLA coach Red Sanders and the L.A. press gave him in Oregon's 13-6 loss. Oregon opened the 1953 season against Nebraska in the first college football game ever televised. From his own 43, Barney Holland turns, gives it to Dick James, off right tackle, James to midfield with the Cornhusker 45 to the 40. James will go all the way on national television, 57 yards, Dick James. Oregon upset Nebraska 20 to 12, but the biggest upset was yet to come. USC came into Portland in 1953, undefeated and ranked number seven in the nation. So we devised this defense on the bus as we were on the way up there, put it on the blackboard uh, just before the ball game, and we went out there and uh, used it. And I think it was something that was a surprise to USC, and, uh, and uh, we, we beat them, I think, that way. We hadn't had that defense, we wouldn't have beaten them. In the first half, Barney Holland drops back to pass, completes the pass to Shaw into the end zone for an Oregon touchdown. I got an awful lot of credit for that because I went down and cut to the sidelines into the end zone, but that's not an easy pass to throw, and Barney had the ball right on the money, and all I had to do was catch it and step into the end zone, and we won the game. 
Oregon made a gutty goal line stand to preserve the win, and Cass got a ride. Oregon finished 1953 four, five, and one, but played every team close and were exciting to watch. He threw the ball into the end zone and they called me for a pass interference. I, I wasn't used to catching the ball. I guess you're not supposed to push the other guy in the back, but I did. So we, Barney said, well, let's try that again. And we <laughs> came up with the same play again. That time we caught it and scored a touchdown. That was fun. Dick James led the team in rushing and scoring, and Shaw was named All-Coast for the second time. Center Ron Feaster was also named All-Coast. Big things were expected of the Ducks in 1954, but they got derailed early when Stanford, led by sophomore quarterback John Brody, upset Oregon 18-13. The season ended with a satisfying 33-14 romp, though, over the Beavers. The Oregon State game was very memorable for James. I had scored three touchdowns in the game, and, and that tied me for the lead in the uh, scoring for the conference that year. And I had a habit of taking a long time in the showers afterwards, just to kind of soak out some of the soreness that I would anticipate having the next day. When I came out of the locker room here, I thought I'd just done a super job out there, and the bus is gone. I am left in Corvallis, in the enemy territory, first of all, and <laughs> all of a sudden this girl came driving up in a car. Well, I happened to know her. It was Sonia Taylor, a friend of the coach's daughter, and uh, she offered me a ride back to Eugene. And so we're driving back to Eugene and had the radio on, and we heard the announcement that her father had just been fired as head coach of Oregon State. So I thought it was a little bit funny. Jasper McGee led the Webfoots in rushing as the Ducks finished third behind USC and UCLA. Guard Jack Patera, seen here causing a fumble against Washington, and later to coach the Seattle Seahawks, was named All-Coast. Shaw, who led the nation in total offense, won the Hoffman Award and became Oregon's seventh All-American. He also won the Pop Warner Trophy, given to the West Coast's outstanding football player. He is the only Oregon player ever selected. Shaw was the number one college player chosen in the 1955 professional football draft. He was selected by the Baltimore Colts. The 1955 Ducks went 6-4 and four again, led by the trio of James and sophomore running backs Jim Shandley and Jack Morris. Shandley finished 10th in the nation in rushing. Face masks were still not in vogue as sophomore Harry Mondale found out the hard way. There was one game uh, that I remember we went over to play the University of Arizona at Tucson and uh, uh, on the first play of the game uh, we kicked off them and I was running down the field and before I knew it, I had three of my front teeth laying in my hand, and I looked down at my teeth and uh, looked down at my hand and saw my teeth there. I would spit them out into my hand, and and I saw, looked around, and saw everybody running down the field along with me. I said, so I just threw them down. I said, I better get going. I threw them down and went on down the field, and uh, uh, I just kept bleeding and playing for the remainder of the game. Uh, Cass said, uh, Johnny McKay says, uh, you better get Harry out of there. He looks like he's hurt. And all McKay says, no, nah, let him play, Cass. He's tough. And so I went on, and I was just a, a mass of blood uh, by the time the game was over. And uh, to this day, I have never found my teeth. <laughs> the Ducks ended the season with their second straight win over Oregon State in the mud at Hayward Field. It was the only time Kaz's teams ever won two straight against the Beavers. But the win meant a lot to him for another reason. We had uh, just come back from Stanford of taking quite a beating. In fact, uh, came back on the campus and I was hung in effigy. And uh, <laughs> then I was crowned the same day, but so it kind of took a little of the sting out of that. But, but we were playing Oregon State, and Oregon State had an exceptionally fine year, and they were supposed to be so much better than we were. And we beat them 28 to nothing, and I think they made three first downs. And uh, though in the minds of a lot of people that it wasn't a bowl game or anything else like that, but after taking such a beating from the week uh, prior to that game and then coming back and I'm beating a very, very fine team so decisively, why, to me, it's one of the most satisfying games I've ever coached. In 1955, Dick James was the Hoffman Award winner. In 1956, the Ducks began the season beating Orange Bowl-bound Colorado 35 to nothing and also whipped USC. 
Another highlight of the season was Thanksgiving Day when Oregon met Oregon State on national TV and played to a 14-14 tie. And Phil McHugh was selected all coast on the 4-4-2 team. In 1957, the Ducks were picked to finish near the bottom of the conference. They started the season with Crabtree again at quarterback. But this time, it was Jack Crabtree. Tom Crabtree had been the quarterback in 1955 and 56. They were the only Crabtrees ever to play at Oregon. They both were quarterbacks. However, they were not related. The season didn't get off to a good start for Crabtree. We win the first one, uh, I believe, 9-6. Uh, in Idaho and uh, kind of struggled to, to, to win that one. The second we came back and had the game won, uh, three to nothing going in the last 20 seconds and uh, a long touchdown pass over somebody's head. Uh, we lost the ball game six to three in the last few moments. Who would have guessed that the GOAT of the six to three loss to Pittsburgh would in 90 days be the most valuable player of the Rose Bowl? The Ducks clinched a trip to the Rose Bowl against USC as Jack Morris ran wild, amassing 212 yards. The 1957 Ducks were the only Oregon team to sweep the four California schools. The Rose Bowl team was a team that accomplished more for the ability they had because you actually analyze that team and there weren't too many great players on that team. In fact, there were very few, but they were a determined group, a uh, fearless group. In fact, uh, the second team, uh, they were termed the ugly ducklings because, I mean, they were a straggly looking bunch, and, uh, but they played with all the enthusiasm and uh, lack of fear. Or nobody was going to be better than they are, and they put out everything you could possibly put out and uh, didn't have all that ability. The Ducks' opponent in the 1958 Rose Bowl was national champion Ohio State, coached by Woody Hayes. The L.A. press called the game one of the biggest mismatches in Rose Bowl history and said Oregon didn't deserve to be on the same field with the Buckeyes. That made everybody a little angry, probably. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, like I mentioned before, it was a very competitive group of people. And I don't think anybody wanted to hear that somebody was going to beat us by six touchdowns. Probably the papers intimidated us more than anything, but they also did us a favor in a lot of ways in our determination was to make them look bad. Jack Morris approaching the ball in the 1958 Rose Bowl is underway. Ballinger back at his two, up the middle to the 10, to the 15, and Peterson brings him down. The Buckeyes surprised no one by taking that kickoff and marching 79 yards for a touchdown. What was surprising was that it turned out to be their only touchdown of the game. Late in the first quarter, the Webfoot's offense got in gear as Jim Shantley streaked for 22 yards. Jack Crabtree displayed the form that would earn him the game's most valuable player trophy. Crabtree's five-yard option run put the Webfoots in scoring position. From the Buckeye five, Crabtree pitches to Shanley, sweeping to the left, cuts outside, touchdown Webfoots! And the Ducks are going crazy on the sideline. It's now a one-point game, and Oregon will go for the tie. Sophomore Willie West hit Ron Stover on one of his ten receptions in the game. In the third quarter, Oregon kept gaining momentum as Jack Morris fought for 15 yards. With a crowd involved in the 7-7 deadlock, Crabtree puts the Ducks in field goal range on an option run. Oregon trying to take the lead. Jack Morris to attempt a 34-yarder. The snap is down. The kick is wide. No good. And we're still tied at seven. Ironically, in the fourth quarter, Ohio State's Jim Sutherland made this 34-yarder to put the Buckeyes ahead 10-7. Oregon made a valiant try late in the game with Charlie Tourville hitting Stover on another circus catch, but the Ducks fell short. Substitute end John Robinson, number 87, got in on the last play for Ron Stover. 
An Ohio State player mistook him, forced over, and congratulated Robinson on his great play. And the Ohio State guy hugged me and said, great game. I said, thank you. For sophomore lineman Tom Keel, now an assistant coach at Cal, the Rose Bowl game was the thrill of a lifetime. I was playing against a great, great big guy, and I got out there, and I was a little bit skittish and a little bit scared, and I went after him kind of uh, tentative. I really didn't go after him. He knocked me five yards uh, back in the backfield. It was like getting cut with an ax. It, he, he hit me so hard it kind of numbed me. And when I was getting up, uh, the same guy that knocked me back deflected the football. And as I was getting up off the ground, I caught the ball. And this is in 400,000 people, and I ran for a first down. And I could run fast. That was one of my uh, characteristics. But uh, I saw one guy between me and the goal line, and I ran right at him and uh, got a first down. I always had a dream later on. I said, gee whiz, what if I'd avoided him and made a touchdown and won the football game because we lost it by a, a field goal? The Ducks gained more yards and first downs than Ohio State and held them to their lowest point production of the season. And they did it without Harry Mondale, injured in the third play of the game, and Captain Norm Chapman, who had broken his leg in the Washington State game. Joe Sheffield, who has been an assistant at Oregon for the last 14 years, took Mondale's place. It was, it was very tough. Uh, they, were, they were big and fast and strong, and I, I think probably, uh, you know, our coaches got us cast and, as, and uh, our coaches got us ready to play, and I believe... Uh, you know, they had, had degraded us so much that, uh, you know, we, they just backed us in a corner and we had to fight like heck to get out of it. Although the Rose Bowl loss was frustrating for Coach Casanova and his staff, the players had done all he could ask of them, and the Ducks had proven the experts were wrong. I think when the game was over, they basically apologized and said we should have won the ball game, and the Ohio State people were uprooting for us when the game was uh, about over. The 1957 year was a hard act to follow, but the Ducks almost did it. They finished second to Oklahoma in team defense, allowing only 50 points all season. Oregon faced number one Oklahoma, and this play, which was not ruled a fumble, cost the Ducks a possible tie or win. Cal went to the Rose Bowl, paced by quarterback Joe Cap. This rare defensive lapse was part of a very frustrating year, as the 1958 Ducks finished four and six. I felt as though we had an excellent football team and we lost uh, six games by a total of less than 50 points. We just didn't capitalize as well in a lot of those uh, games that we lost by small margins. One game that did not have a small margin was a 25-0 triumph over USC. Here West runs for 66 yards. West led the 1958 Ducks in rushing and was selected all coast. The 1959 team finished 8-2 and, and came within 10 points of a perfect 10-0 season. On October 17, 1959, the Ducks pulled off one of the biggest upsets ever. Nationally ranked Air Force had not been beaten in two years. The Ducks smothered the Falcons 20-3. The 1960 team tied its last regular season game with Oregon State. They finished eighth nationally in total offense and lost only two games, one to Michigan and the other to Rose Bowl bound Washington. Their outstanding season earned them a trip to the Liberty Bowl in Philadelphia versus Penn State. It was a close game in the snow for three quarters, but Penn State pulled away in the fourth. Dave Grayson, the leading ground gainer in 1960, remembers a game against Washington State that year. We were beating uh, uh, Washington State. The score was 12 nothing at halftime. And, and Kaz would come out and, and he would put a cigarette down and put it out on the, on, uh, on the meeting room floor. And, and he would say, what's the score? And, and, and we were supposed to say 0-0. Zero, zero. And rah, 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 well, this particular time, uh, Lynn Burnett uh, said the score is 12 nothing, And everything was silent, and Kaz didn't know what to say. In fact, he kind of stumbled for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> All Coast players were Dave Gross, guard Dave Urell, and sophomore tackle Steve Barnett. And Hilliard, and Hilliard is hit by Barnett. 
The 1961 Ducks kept on trying as they did in this 1907 win over Stanford, but wound up a disappointing four and six. In that game, sophomore Mel Renfro, playing with a sore ankle, turned in a spectacular performance. He touched the ball five times and scored three times on a 94-yard kickoff return, a 39-yard option pass, and a four-yard run. Renfro, from Jefferson High School in Portland, and probably the most highly recruited football player to come to Oregon, tells why he chose Oregon. I guess the, the recruiters from Oregon got to my parents, and my parents were, were sold on Len Casanova and uh, Bill Barman as the track coach, and I think the pendulum really swung when my parents uh, uh, told me that they would like for me to go to Oregon, so uh, that's what I did. In 1961, Steve Barnett became Oregon's eighth All-American. Bron Snydell, who was the, uh, another uh, two-way player at that time, we both averaged about 58 minutes a game, uh, which is a lot of playing time and uh, our senior years. Uh, so it, it does get tiring, and I'm not sure you're as, uh, always as effective as you can be, but um, uh, at the time we enjoyed it and thought that we were invincible. Yeah. The 1962 Ducks opened the season against powerhouse Texas with a little-known sophomore at quarterback. Oregon beat themselves on two fumbles but had found a quarterback. Bob Berry rolling left. A man clear Imwali at about the 35. Imwali blocked for Murphy's down to about the 20. 15. Dick Imwali headed for the end zone out of bounds at the one yard line. Bob was a fun type of guy. Uh, I mean, just tough as nails. Uh, get in the huddle and, uh, you know, it's it's uh, bleep it, bleep it, bleep it, you know, and we're going to get him. Uh, you know, just a, a terrific athlete, a tough athlete, could throw the ball extremely well. Barry and Renfro were at times unstoppable. The Ducks won six games and tied Rose Bowl bound Washington 21-21. On the last play of the Washington game, Oregon might have won, but some kids ran into the end zone, interfering with Barry's pass to Larry Hill. The 1962 Civil War game in Corvallis was one of the closest and most intensive ever played. Bob Barry back to pass. He's uh, looking down the middle, almost falls. The pass is on the way. It's at uh, 10 yard line. It's been throw complete. Touchdown, Oregon. The Ducks took the lead 17 to 6 at the half on this 38-yard Buck Corey field goal. Brooks uh, back to kick. It's a uh, it's a squibber going down to the five. Renfro waiting there. Oh, he hit him in the knee. Beavers recovered. The Beavers, led by Heisman Trophy winner Terry Baker, came back in the second half. Oregon State won 20 to 17 despite the brilliant play of Dave Wilcox. It was kind of like a chess game, and I could see everything in front of me. That's the reason I like defense, because I knew if the play was run a certain way offensively, I knew where all the offensive people were going to be. Now, what got screwed up is when one of those guys didn't know what they were doing and ran the wrong way and got everybody messed up. But it's not, it's not such a hard, I mean, it's uh, in playing defense and in football, it's better to give than receive. And, uh, I mean, you're going to get hurt a lot of times if you're not, not playing 100%, and if you're not, you're just sitting kind of catching people. Now, that's when you get hurt. So you do unto others before they do it to you, which is that's not. <laughs> Besides Lund Casanova, uh, one of the reasons that I like the University of Oregon, as opposed to Oregon State, now my, my parents were from Oklahoma. They came out on pro throws, a big southern. So he came over. My parents wanted me to go to Oregon State. But the uniforms at Oregon State were awful. They just were horrible, worst-looking things I've ever seen. And I liked Oregon's uniforms. Now, that's really an intelligent decision. The epitome of Civil War was high school teammates Mel Renfro and Terry Baker battling each other. The fact that uh, Terry and I played in high school together and the fact that uh, in college he beat me twice uh, was not a, a pleasant thing for me, but... You know, those things happen and you have to live with it. In 1962, Mel Renfro became Oregon's ninth All-American. I didn't feel like anybody could stop me. I felt like if you put 11 guys defensively against me, I would find a way to defeat them. Uh, sports uh, was always uh, a game to me. You know, it was never a business. Uh, it's like sandlot football. 
the game that really stands out in my mind more than any other was when I played in Houston uh, in 62 at Rice Stadium when uh, my grandparents and a lot of my relatives uh, came to see the ball game and Houston was where I was born and I hadn't been back there in, in many years and the uh, high, uh, the uh, headlines read after the game that you know Renfro runs Rice ragged and, and actually I felt like that was probably my best performance overall in college uh, offensively defensively and uh, you know in the specialty area. I think Mel is the finest all-around football player that I ever coached. The 1963 team had lots of firepower as their backfield composed of Bob Berry, Mel Renfro, Lou Bain, and Larry Hill was called the Firehouse Four. In that year, one of the most memorable games in Oregon history took place. Here's the Wuskies kick. Ball is down, it's up, and it's good. Indiana takes a one-point lead. Ball is in the Oregon 37-yard line. Here's the snap. Berry uh, dropping back to the left side. Looks down the middle, Renfro, it's Renfro, great one-hand catch, Renfro's got it, first down, or 18 seconds to go, Ducks at the Indiana 30, very rolling right, looking down, looking into the end zone, H.D. Murphy's in the end zone, he's got it, the Ducks win! Yeah, the game was like a symphony, it just uh, developed into uh, that crescendo at the end, and was uh, just a... Uh, a great exciting uh, contest. The 1963 Ducks went seven and three, including a 31-14 thumping of Oregon State. Renfro was injured and could not play, but Bain, Hill, and H.D. Murphy took up the slack. Renfro was named All-American for the second time. He was by far and away the best college football player I'd ever seen, and, and the things he could do were just uh, unbelievable. For instance, in the huddle, I'd say, Melvin, what pattern can you get open on? And he'd say, anything you want. He would. He was great. The Ducks earned a trip to El Paso to play in the first Sun Bowl game and downed SMU 21-14. We, I think, approached that game in, in, a, in a sort of a fun, fun manner. We went down to win, but uh, we had a lot of time off, and, and uh, we really enjoyed ourselves down there. Uh, you might say it was sort of a Christmas holiday for us, but uh, when it came game time, we did what we had to do to win the game. Three points separated the 1964 Ducks from a 10-0 season and the Rose Bowl. Counting the 1963 season, the Ducks had won 10 in a row and were ranked number seven in the nation until they met underdog Stanford. Bob Berry was injured, but still Oregon led 8-7 until this play. And I'll never forget this. Doug Post was our punter, and he punted, and he was just flattened. I mean, but flat on the ground, roughed, and uh, it wasn't called. And with, I think, 13 seconds to go, then they, they kicked a field goal and beat us 10 to 8. After the game, the Stanford coaches came up, and they said, how the Dickens, that uh, official didn't call that play. Well, we could have run out the clock with the, with the time that... Uh, they had, and we should have had that, uh, that victory. Without Barry, the Ducks barely tied Washington State and then fell behind Indiana 21-7 at halftime of their next game. John Robinson, now the coach of the Rams, uh, was one of my assistants, and he said, we've got to change things. And I, I said, we're not going to change anything. He said, these guys got to just get out and play some ball. And I ran and raved practically the whole whole first a half, telling them the things that they had been doing wrong and everything else. I think it was, uh, in my recollection, one of Kaz's most motivating halftime speeches. He actually used some words that I'd never heard him use before, and, and I'm, I'm sure he got everybody's attention. He got mine. During this time, why Dave Toby, who was my center and also kicked off for me, got up to go to the bathroom, and I told him, I said, Dave, sit down. So he went over and sat down, and that, uh, on the ensuing kickoff in the second half, uh, we were kicking off to Indiana, and uh, he shanked the ball, and it went down about 12, 15 yards, and uh, Les Palm uh, was out there, fell on him for an onside kick. After the game, why, all the press and saying what a great strategy that was, uh, how you were behind and you needed to get a hold of that ball and, and to, to score and 
actually what happened and Dave said uh, Toby said later he says boy he says I had to go to the bathroom so badly that he says I could hardly swing my leg in there and that's actually what that's what actually happened <laughs> it wasn't a case of any strategy at, at all <laughs> Oregon scored 22 unanswered points to stop Indiana 29-21. Oregon's heartbreaking last-minute loss to Oregon State ended a 7-2-1 season and kept Oregon out of a bowl game. Senior Bob Berry broke all of Oregon's passing records and became Oregon 10th All-American. He had the entire squad and the entire coaching staff just believing in him that he could do it. You put Berry in there and he'll do it. And uh, he usually did. The 1965 Webfoots were picked in the preseason top ten and started out 3-0 and until they met Stanford again. Fourth down, 15, Lewis back to pass, looking down to the left side. Pass is high, incomplete, oh, there's a flag on the play, looks like interference. The Ducks only won one more game the rest of the season. Steve Bunker caught 51 passes to break Ray Palm's record and also led the team in scoring with 56 points. The defense, led by number 40, linebacker Tim Casey, was called Casey's Commandos. Casey was also a first-team academic All-American. Three plays in 1966 continue to carry with them vivid memories for three different players. For linebacker Gunther Cunningham, now a defensive line coach with the San Diego Chargers, a play against Stanford was an unforgettable experience. And, uh, it was a third down play in about an inch, and, and they uh, ran the tailback up inside, and I was an inside linebacker, and I weighed about 210, I think, at the time, and, and Jack Root happened to be the leading blocker, and, and I didn't have any teeth left in my head. These are all false teeth that you see now, and uh, cut my lips severely, my arm all up. I had blood from head to toe. And uh, I came to the sideline. All I can remember is John Robinson saying, boy, this is a hell of a game, isn't it, Gunn? And I, I just blood spattered, and uh, my face mask was broken. And they punted the ball, and we stopped him. And uh, I played the whole game. And, and uh, the trainer there at the time uh, told me, just put some tape in your mouth. <laughs> It'll be all right. So I did it. And Bob, was that Bob Officer? You bet it was Bob Officer. <laughs> and I played the whole football game. And the great thing about it is we beat them 7-3. And, and uh, they had a really good team. What about Root? What's he doing? Well, it, there's another <laughs> twist to the story. I went on to coach at Stanford, and one of the people that helped recruit uh, for me at Stanford was Jack Root, who's a dentist. <laughs> I was real lucky in that the receiver slipped and uh, picked off the ball at my shoe tops. I managed to hurdle over a guy, and then Jim Nicolason made a key block that knocked two men out of the way, and then it was just straight ahead. And the thing I remember the most about it, though, was how tired I was because it was at 7,000 feet where it happened and I was gasping for breath and then the whole team jumped on top of me. And of course, I've replayed that a thousand times in my mind. It was the highlight I, of my college career. On the last play of the 1966 season, another record was set. A linebacker by the name of Harry Cartellis. Now, he was slow as buttermilk going uphill, so he, he threw the ball off to me, you know, and, and 96-yard touchdown resulted. Smith was named All-Coast as a defensive back in Kaz's last season as a coach. Of course, Kaz has always been the uh, sort of the father figure, you know, for the players. And, you know, I appreciate the, the things that, you know, that he taught me. You know, we used to have some, some good conversations, and he taught me a lot more about, about football, but a lot of things about life, you know, and just, you know, being persistent and, you know, in things that you want to do. Leo Harris was Oregon's first athletic director and served from 1947 to 1967. I can recall being a student or a freshman incoming student at the University of Oregon and hearing Leo Harris talk about uh, his dream and this particular stadium. Uh, lo and behold, uh, little did I know that I would be the person that would eventually uh, complete it. But uh, it was my privilege and uh, it was uh, certainly the stadium buy of the century in terms of dollars and cents. I remember taking the model back to uh, Cleveland, Ohio and displaying it uh, in the national convention. People saying there's no way you can build that for two and one fourth million dollars and there's no way you can have it done in one year. In both cases, of course, it was done and, and ready and remains today as a real monument to, to him and to Oregon football, a very fine uh, football stadium to, for both spectators and for players. With a new stadium came a new head coach, Cass's line coach from 1958 to 1966, Jerry Fry. In Fry's first year, the Ducks continually improved. 
The Ducks' defense was quick and tough, led by All Coast nose guard George Dames. We put together a, a group of guys that were as, as aggressive and active as any group that I can remember. I think we, we were second or third in the conference in defense. And, uh, uh, Jimmy Smith. And, uh, uh, Jimmy Smith, Omri Hildreth, uh, uh, George Dames, Kent Grote, a number of really, really, not very big guys. You know, we didn't scare anybody getting off the bus, but we uh, played very well. The Ducks were the only team in 1967 to hold down O.J. Simpson. USC with OJ with his speed, 9-3, speed, uh, would, would try to run around you, basically. And, and he, uh, uh, our, our defense was well suited to stop that. And uh, so he was averaging 185 yards a game. And uh, lo and behold, uh, we, 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 we stopped him. We stopped him. He had 65 yards. And, uh, and then in the third quarter, uh, uh, I finally got in on a tackle and uh, we put him out of the game and and uh, ironically that started a friendship and he has never forgotten me I'm sure he's met millions of people but he's never forgotten my name Jimmy Smith was selected to five all-american teams becoming Oregon's 11th all-american he also was the number one draft pick of the Washington Redskins Although from 1966 to 1968, Claxton Welch never played on a team with a record above 500, he still felt like a winner. There was no one in uh, college football that had bigger hearts than the guys in our team. We always worked hard. We worked harder than everybody else. And I really picked up a, a good work ethic by uh, playing at the University of Oregon. Coach Fry had the Fighting Ducks improving again in 1969 to 5-5-1 five, five and one as some talented sophomores contributed. Andy Maurer, a senior in 1969, remembers one of the sophomores. Uh, Jerry Fry says, I think you ought to uh, become a tight end. And I said, no, nah, there's no way. There's no rookie around that's, uh, that's large enough or good enough that can beat me out. So I just keep my spot. And so the rookies uh, line up in front and the veterans in back, you know, how we do our tryouts and all this stuff. And... I watched a kid by the name of Bobby Moore, now Ahmad Rashad. He ran down, put a move on the corner, went, caught the ball, stuffed it behind his back, and I never competed against him. I went right to Jerry and says, I'd like to be a tight end. With Maurer at tight end, Bobby Moore at flanker, and Bob Newland at split end, quarterback Tom Blanchard probably had the best receiving core in the country. Tom, uh, given uh, the injuries he had, had about as good a career as a guy could have at Oregon. And if he hadn't hurt his knee, I'm sure he would have had several years playing as a quarterback in the NFL. He still had a great career in the NFL, punting for 10 or 11 years. And uh, one of those years, he was uh, all NFL as a punter. But uh, Tom was one of the great, quiet leaders uh, of the years that I was playing football at Oregon. Moore was all coast and in that year set records for TD receptions with 10 and scoring with 92 points. On October 10th, the Ducks met UCLA in the Coliseum with both teams needing a win to keep their Rose Bowl hopes alive. Oregon moved the ball well as Dan Fouts scored twice in the first quarter on a 15-yard quarterback draw and later on a quarterback sneak. Here, Bobby Moore, now known as Ahmad Rashad, who had been switched from flanker to tailback at the beginning of the season, put Oregon ahead 21-10 with his second quarter touchdown. But from then on, it was all Bruins, as they scored 30 unanswered points. Oregon almost scored in the third quarter. The reason that I had to leave the game because of injuries, because we tried another quarterback sneak on about the one-yard line uh, for a touchdown. And uh, Jim Fagoni, my center, uh, lost the grip on the ball as he was snapping it. And it rolled between my legs. And I was down looking for the ball between my legs. And I got hit by about six Bruins. And they knocked me out. The Bruins' last score came with 4.38 left in the game as Dennis Dummett hit Gary Campbell, now a backfield coach at Oregon. Uh, under any ordinary circumstances, uh, you would think that uh, a game that you're at least 20 points ahead and at the end of the game that you're in all probability you're going to win the game and you send in your reserves to give them some playing time. This was not to be an ordinary game. At this point, with a score of 40-21, Thousands of Bruin fans left the stadium. Four minutes to go in the Coliseum. I can recall Jess Hill from uh, USC and uh, J.D. Morgan both saying to us, uh, well, congratulations, uh, your young men uh, played a magnificent game.
this point, with a score of 40-21, thousands of Bruin fans left the stadium. Four minutes to go in the Coliseum, I can recall Jess Hill from uh, USC and uh, J.D. Morgan both saying to us, uh, well, congratulations, uh, your young men uh, played a magnificent game. When UCLA scored their last points, that I really virtually closed my playbook upstairs, I was in the press box, and I said to myself, we've lost. Coach Fry was uh, a real wonderful person to me because I uh, was hurt all the time, and that, that hurt Coach Fry. He, uh, when Dan went out of the game, he came up to me as a senior and said, Tom, if, uh, if you want to go in and play, I'm asking you that, uh, to make that decision. But he says, I'm not going to make you because Dan's getting the crap kicked out of him and we're probably not going to win the game. So if you don't want to play, fine, we'll put Harvey in, uh, one of our other good quarterbacks. He was our third quarterback at the time. I didn't want to go in, but I was a senior. And I couldn't very well say, no, I don't want to go in, coach. <laughs> so I said, sure, I'll go in. Blanchard looks over the defense, steps back to pass, looks right, finds Bob Newland out there, caught by Newland at the 45 in UCLA territory and out at the 40. It was kind of a wet feeling out on the field, and I was really tired. Ahmad Rashad came walking into the huddle and stayed, made the statement that, hey, guys, let's pick it up. I can score anywhere in this field in 10 seconds. The Ducks at the UCLA 30, 417 to go, second and 10 for Oregon. Back to pass, Blanchard. Looks right. Looks for Bobby Moore. Has him in the open at the UCLA 22. Caught by Bobby at the 20. Down to the 15. Wrapped up by one man. Gets away. 10-5. Touchdown, University of Oregon. How did Bobby Moore get away from that one? All of a sudden, I wasn't so tired anymore, and there was a feeling in the offense that, heck, whoever had the ball last was going to end up winning the game, and all we needed to do was get the ball back. Oregon lining up for the kickoff. Ken Woody to kick it for the Ducks. Onside kick to the left. Rolls down to the 50-yard line to the 47-46. Scramble for the football, and who's got it? UCLA has come up with possession of the football. Jim Nader up behind center, third and eight for the Bruins. The clock running under three minutes to go. Nader rolls left, wants to pitch back, throws behind his tailback. Mike Johnson hits the quarterback, and Delton Lewis comes up with it for Oregon at the UCLA 40-yard line. Blanchard back to pass, looks left, nobody open, looks right. Moore out of the backfield, down the right sidelines. Wide open, Bobby Moore at the 25. 15, 10, 5, touchdown, University of Oregon. Bobby Moore wide open. The Ducks with only one timeout left. They do need the ball back. Let's see what happens. Woody approaches the football, kicks it down to the UCLA 50 to the left side, scramble for the football at the 49. Oregon has recovered. Blanchard calling the play. He goes right, pitches right, Bobby Moore. Blanchard leading the way over the right tackle spot. Bobby, no place to go, knocked down at the 45. Oregon calls a timeout. I went to the sideline, uh, John Robinson was my coach, and, and Jerry Fry, they, they looked in my eyes and they said, what is wrong? I had tears in my eyes. And I said, nothing. It wasn't because I was courageous, it was because I was embarrassed to tell him I was hurt again. And he gets up and he's rocky and he comes running over the sideline. Well, John Robinson, Robbie, he yells at me, check him. So I, uh, I thought it was his jaw and, and so did Robbie. So I went over and I said, how is it? And he says, oh, it's my shoulder. So I reached inside his shoulder pad and I could feel the bone sticking up and I knew it was an AC separation right there. He says, I'm all right, I'm all right, I can go back in. So later he told me that they, he hoped that they would not call a pass play, but sure enough they did. Well, it turned out that was the last one. Tommy looking over the UCLA four-man defensive front. Now the Bruins set five men up front. Blanchard back to pass, wants to find somebody long, looks to the left sidelines, throws long for Leland Glass. Leland down there with two UCLA Bruins wrestled for the football at the 11-yard line. Oregon has possession of it. It goes to the University of Oregon. They are back in this football game. I got poked in my eye right before I caught this pass. And I saw two balls. I just jumped up. Whichever one I feel, I just grabbed it. <laughs> Uh, the, play, the play was ruled a simultaneous catch down on the five-yard line. But now Leland's got to go out of the game because he can't see. Tom's got to go out of the game because his arm is hanging there. So they send in Ken Woody, our, our place kicker, as Leland's replacement. Fouts looking over the defense. Tams off to Moore. Bobby behind to block over right guard. Seven-yard line, six, five-yard line. Looking over the defense, Danny calls the play. Line is set. Fouts rolls right. Looking to pass, Danny trying to find somebody open, being chased back at the UCLA 11 and wrestled down at the 15. 
Uh, the next play, we sent, uh, we were in a uh, I slot formation with the two wide receivers to the to the left and, and just the tight end and the tailback behind me. And we swung uh, Bobby Moore out to the right side. Uh, the Bruins, uh, Moore had scored on this play three or four times, th two times earlier. They went all after him. And Third down on the UCLA 14, 15 to go for the touchdown. Out sets the team at the line of scrimmage. Danny wants to pass, drops straight back in the pocket, looks over the middle. Greg Speck is there in the end zone. Touchdown, caught Greg Speck. And for a perfect strike, I saw it coming. I could see the, I could see the, uh, I could see the ball twirl, and I'm thinking, Jesus, this is easy. Just don't drop it, or my folks won't let me come home. Um, uh, there it was. It was very simple. It was over too quick. Uh, uh, that was probably the biggest throw of my career. I think uh, I've never seen an offensive game plan work as well as that one did that day. And I think John Robinson deserves a lot of credit for that. The excitement that we had offensively, I was an assistant that worked with the offense, and we put three touchdowns on the board, one after the other, and, and did it in a manner that really gave us a lot of pleasure. So it was a, one of the big games for me. This certainly had to be the most exciting football game I've ever seen or ever have been around. And I told myself after that game, I will never, ever decide that the game is over until it's over. And uh, I think I've carried that with me. So it was a great learning experience for me. And uh, at the end of the ball game, I was able to uh, shake J.D.'s hand and say, uh, uh, J.D., your young man certainly played magnificently. <laughs> UCLA played as the year before at Austin Stadium. I think the final score is 17-14. Anyway, it's about the last minute or so of the game, and we were trying to get the ball back, and so they were running the clock out. And this is something I've never seen happen before. Dennis Dummett was the quarterback, and he came up to the line of scrimmage, and before calling his signals, he kind of got down over the quarterback, over the center, and he kind of yelled out so all the defensive players could hear it, you guys always come so close. And I'll tell you, that was the first time I really wanted to get the pile on somebody. So the next year, after we came back, and after the uh, game, the handshakes were being handed out, I went up to Dennis and said, you guys always come so close. Really my first or second year as athletic director, and I'd been down at Roseburg, and uh, they asked me who was going to win the game at uh, UCLA, and I said, well, it's going to be a high-scoring game. In fact, I think John Robinson had told me that and uh, he indicated that uh, but it'll be a high-scoring game, but Oregon will win, uh, score 41-40, to 40, and lo and behold, it was. The win over UCLA was just one of three big wins in 1970 as Oregon finished 6-4-1. and one. The Ducks edged USC 10-7 in a driving rain at Autzen. Two weeks later, Air Force, ranked in the top 10 and the nation's top rated passing team, met Oregon, the second rated passing offense in the country. Dan Fouts and Bob Newland were at the top of their game as they both set school records. Fouts for the most yards passing in a game and Newland for the most receptions in a game with 11. In the last minute of the first half, Fouts drove the Ducks down the field, completing every pass, including a last-second touchdown to Newland and two-point conversion. Newland caught a long touchdown pass later in the game to sew up the victory 46-35. to After the Air Force game, the Ducks were rated 17th in the country, but could only manage a last-minute tie against a hungry Army team that had won only one game all season. The last score for Oregon came on one of Rashad's greatest runs. I remember the uh, the Army game when we had to tie them with uh, you know, the fourth quarter to escape getting beat. Uh, we called just a simple blast play up the middle to Ahmad, and, and he literally ran through the entire Army team, uh, right up the middle, 50 yards or so. And, and he was exhausted. He'd already played an entire game. Here he takes the ball down and scores. And now we're still down by two points. We've got to go for the two-point conversion. We call a little sprint out and a pass to, to Ahmad. He gets hit by two Army guys and struggles to get in that end zone for the two-point conversion. It was one of the greatest efforts I've ever been associated with. The season ended on a sour note with Oregon's seventh straight loss to the Beavers. Tom Graham, an inspirational leader, was all Pac-8 as a linebacker along with senior defensive back Lionel Coleman. In 1970, Rashad was named all Pac-8 for the second time as he became Oregon's first 1,000-yard runner. More, more all-time records were set in 1970. Against Illinois, Tom Blanchard hit Bob Newland on Oregon's longest pass-run play of 95 yards. Newland's 225 yards receiving in that game is also a school record. Bob Newland from North Eugene High School became Oregon's 12th first-team All-American. 
Robbie was the kind of coach that uh, had me believing when I was a senior that I was the best uh, wide receiver in America. He was a real enthusiastic uh, hauler type of guy. The thing I remember most about Robbie was he taught us so much about the passing game. When I went from Oregon into the NFL, I felt like I knew a lot, and I think that that was a big factor in my being able to make the team on the Saints when I was a rookie. And uh, Robbie was a teacher. He was enthusiastic. We always had fun. Practices were fun. Games were fun. And football was never drudgery. Newland also still holds the records for most receptions in a season with with 67 and total yards in one year with 1,123. In 1971, the Ducks again went into the last two weeks of the season with a chance to win at least seven games. But they finished below 500 as they lost two close ones. The highlight of the season was the second consecutive win over USC. In the Coliseum, second string quarterback Harvey Wynn, replacing an injured Dan Fouts, turned in a gritty performance. Win through for three touchdowns against the Trojans, the big one a 60-yarder to Larry Battle. One week later, the fourth largest crowd in Autzen Stadium history saw the Ducks down the Huskies 23-21. Dave Piper's interception return of a sunny six-killer pass sparked a 23-point second-half explosion by the Ducks. Against Oregon State, the Ducks played well despite missing Rashad and Tom Graham due to injuries. Oregon lost a heartbreaking decision to the Beavers 30 to 29. That one point not only was the difference between a winning and a losing season, but proved to be the fatal blow to Jerry Fry's competitive program that he had built. Under alumni pressure, Fry resigned a few months after that season ended. Tackle Tom Drugas from Sunset High School in Portland opened many holes for the running backs and protected the quarterbacks. Drugas was not only the first round draft pick of the Baltimore Colts, he also became Oregon's 13th All-American. I think a lot of the strengths of, of my pick on All-American teams had to do with my, my ability in the eyes of scouts to be a, a pro candidate. Uh, and I think that a lot of people looked at me because of some of the other people that were on the team that I played on that they were looking at. So they looked at us all together. But in particular, I think it was a combination of my size, my pass blocking ability, and my ability to just work within a pro offense. Maude Rashad was named All-Pac-8 for the third time, and in 1971 became Oregon's 14th All-American. In that year against Utah, he ran for 249 yards and still holds 14 other school records, including points scored, most pass receptions, and most yards rushing. Records were made to be broken, but they were made to be broken by great players. And it's going to take a great player to come along and break those records because uh, uh, I was in an offensive system that really took advantage of my offensive talents. And um, it makes me feel good that those records that were set 15 or some years ago are still standing now, but uh, I'm sure they'll be broken. Maybe my son will break them. The, the sacrifice that he made to become a running back in a tail, an eye back, in a, in a high formation, uh, it, it's really uh, probably under, underestimated because uh, he sacrificed a great deal. Uh, he was probably one of the toughest players I've ever played with. Uh, he took tremendous beating week after week. I had to be talked into being a running back because I enjoyed playing the outside and not dealing with those linebackers or defensive linemen. But um, after I got the hang of it, and I'd say I got the hang of it after the Stanford game. Stanford game, I think I carried the ball for 20 sometimes for a minus three yards. After that game, I got the hang of it, and I wasn't too bad of a running back. I enjoyed it. Uh, it's a totally different frame of mind you have to go into a game as running back as opposed to wide receiver. Wide receiver is sort of an artiste sort of position, and running back is a, is a workhorse, and you got to be... Uh, serious about it. Come on, guys, let's do it. Let's do it. Jerry Fry's line coach, Dick Enright, became the new head coach for 1972 and 1973. Enright inherited such future NFL players as Fouts, Tim Stokes, George Martin, and Russ Francis. I have a lot of fond memories of not only going to the University of Oregon, but also playing there. I really only played one full year because of injuries and freshmen weren't allowed to play and that type of thing. And then I didn't play my senior year and they had a couple of coaching changes. It was very exciting. But the year that I did play, uh, I had a great time just uh, playing SC and Stanford and, and that type of thing. I still root for the Ducks whenever they're playing. 
1972, Donnie Reynolds' 60-yard run in the first quarter was all the Ducks needed as they trounced Oregon State 30-3 and ended the eight-year famine. <laughs> Oregon was the only team in the Pac-8 to offer Fouts a scholarship, and in Johnny Robinson's mind, made more of his talent than any other player he coached at Oregon. Well, of course, Dan Fouts, uh, who will be in the NFL Hall of Fame, uh, one of the great NFL quarterbacks of all time, came to Oregon without being heavily recruited, developed uh, a tremendous skill level here. In my mind, clearly, he is the one above all others. In 1973, Steve Donnelly was all Pac-8, an honor he repeated in 1974. Tight end Russ Francis from Pleasant Hill was all Pac-8 also along with defensive tackle Reggie Lewis. Donnie Reynolds became the second player to run for over 1,000 yards in a season. Uh, we played Air Force one year in, uh, in Oregon and uh, we uh, weren't supposed to win that game and we went out and gave them uh, a very good go of it and I, I hit the quarterback in the end zone which forced up a, an interception and uh, uh, a gentleman who went on to make his mark in the pros, Mario Clark, intercepted and ran in for a touchdown and that's one of my, my great memories at the U of O. In two short years, the coach whose team finally beat Oregon State and who humiliated Washington was gone. Don Reed, Enright's offensive coordinator, took over for the next three years. Reed tried to inject a more wide-open offense to complement senior Don Reynolds, who finished in 1974 as Oregon's second all-time ground gainer. Quarterback Jack Henderson and receiver Greg Bauer were key players for Reed during 1975 and 1976. In 1977, Rich Brooks, who had spent nine years as a player and coach at Oregon State, replaced Don Reed. Uh, of course, I had, had been gone. I'd coached at UCLA two different times with the Rams and the 49ers, so there was some time in between uh, uh, the two schools. But I'm in a profession where coaching is my job and my business, and uh, I think that uh, I was given an opportunity here at the University of Oregon that I wasn't given at Oregon State to be a head coach. and. Uh, uh, I, uh, I really appreciate that opportunity, and uh, I just want to make the people here uh, glad they had me. In his first year, the Ducks fell to 2-9, and nine, as big plays like this 61-yard strike from Jack Henderson to Ken Page were few and far between. All-Pro San Francisco 49ers center Fred Quillen remembers the Oregon fans during those lean years. Uh, Lord knows they weren't spoiled. You know, we didn't have, we didn't give them much to be spoiled about. So they, uh, they just liked us for uh, for what we were. We just tried hard, and uh, and uh, they liked us when they when they saw a good game. My senior year was the third year that we beat them in a row, and that was a record for us. Uh, that was the first time the Oregon has beat Oregon State in a, in a, for th uh, three consecutive times. Uh, that's the first time that had happened for many, many years. And, and in fact, um, I don't believe they've beat them yet. Um, so I think there was a tie in there. But uh, those Oregon State games, the Civil War games, were definitely the highlight of the year for us. The Oregon State victory my first year, the 28-16 to win here in Austin Stadium in 77, was... We had to pull it all out of the hat, the fake field goal, uh, the halfback pass, uh, the fake punt, the whole deal. And uh, it was, uh, I think, a, a very satisfying win at that stage of my career. Through 1987, Brooks holds the uncanny record of 17-0-2 as a player and coach on both sides of the Civil War rivalry. As the head coach at Oregon, he is 10-0 with one tie. In 1977, another school record was set. 1978 could be called the close but no cigar season, as the Ducks lost six games by a total of 19 points and four in a row in the last three minutes of the game. One of their two wins came against Washington State, as world-class sprinter Don Coleman turned on the Jets. The football program made a quantum leap forward in 1979 as the Ducks posted their first winning record in nine years, and Brooks was named Pac-10 and District 9 Coach of the Year. Undoubtedly, the biggest key to the Ducks' success was the emergence of Reggie Ogburn. Ogburn, an explosive running and passing threat, continually kept the opposition off balance with his quickness and dazzling speed. 
Ogburn ran for more yards in 1979 and in his career at Oregon than any other quarterback in Oregon history. Symbolic of the reversal of Oregon's fortunes was this reverse against Stanford, as Dwight Robertson benefited from Greatwood and Kurt Jackson's blocks. In the 80s, the university has maintained its beauty and heritage while keeping up with a changing world. In 1980, the Ducks went 6-3-2, and two, which is still their best record under Rich Brooks. 1979 and 1980 were the first times Oregon teams had back-to-back -back winning seasons since 1963 and 1964. Two of Brooks' most satisfying wins came in 1980. The game against uh, Michigan State when we beat them here 35-9 uh, to 9 in Autzen Stadium. Uh, uh, we were out ready to take our Friday warm-up and uh, the Michigan State team came off and kind of went by our players as they were going out and started a little chant saying duck soup, duck soup, duck soup. Well, uh, I think that put a little bit uh, of emotion into our players and uh, we went out and uh, showed uh, uh, Michigan State that they were the main ingredient in that duck soup the next day. Ducks avenged the 1979 nightmare against Washington by thumping the Huskies 34-10 in Seattle. Steve Brown's second half interception return was the knockout punch that put Washington away. Another one of Oregon's impressive games was against UCLA, rated in the top ten, as both Washington and USC had been before facing the Ducks. The game went down to the wire, but the Oregon secondary held off three UCLA attempts near the goal line. Brian Hinkle had an outstanding game and was voted Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Week an amazing four times that season. The Ducks capped the season by blasting the Beavers again in Corvallis, thereby sweeping the three Northwest schools for the first time since 1954. Despite some great performances, it became obvious in 1981 just how much Ogburn, the spark that ignited the team, was missed. A win over Oregon State was about the only consolation for a year of shattered dreams. In 1982, Oregon improved slightly, although their record was still 2-9. The Ducks' defense kept them in games and was led by all Pac-10 performers Steve Brown and Mike Walter. Coach Brooks has never seen a player play as hard for an entire game from the snap of the ball to the whistle as Walter. Mike, now a starting linebacker with the 49ers, has learned that success does not always come easily. Coach Schaufield was a, was, a, was a great man to play for, and I think sometimes when I got really frustrated in football and uh, I felt like almost giving it up, you know, Coach Schaufield was there, you know, to talk to or, and uh, to keep me going. Mike Jorgensen's performance was impressive the latter part of the season. One of the highlights of the year was against Notre Dame. At Autzen, Jorgensen hit Osborne Thomas to set up a touchdown, and Notre Dame had to come back to tie the Ducks. Jorgensen also led the Ducks to an upset victory over Arizona. Going into the Civil War game, Oregon had only one win, and were fortunate to escape Corvallis with two. The Beavers led six to nothing with two and a half minutes to go until this play. Jorgensen looking, the Ducks still trying to get on the scoreboard, fires for Osborne Thomas, he's open, touchdown! 1983 turned out to be an unpredictable year. It, the low points of the year were at the beginning and the end. In the season opener, the Ducks got whipped by Pacific. In the finale, the Ducks and the Beavers, under very wet conditions, could not get on the scoreboard, although they had numerous opportunities. The more positive side of 1983 came against Houston, Cal, Arizona, and Stanford. Against number nine Arizona, the Ducks scored a major upset. The defense, led by two-time Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Week, Dan Ralph, throttled the Wildcats. The game was also very memorable for Gary Zimmerman, now with the Minnesota Vikings. Whenever, nobody gave us a chance, and we went in there, and they were tough, and... Uh, we just battled with them and we, we beat them. Finally, their fans came over to our side, started booing the Arizona team. And uh, they didn't cheer for us, but they booed the Arizona team and we came out of there with a victory. And, you know, I got the game ball for that game and I think that's what sticks in my mind the best. Against UCLA, two new 1983 faces made their presence felt. After falling behind 21-0, Coach Brooks decided it was Miller time. Lou Barnes, 
who made all Pac-10 as a punt returner and won the Hoffman Award, fielded a UCLA punt and made one of the great all-time cuts to find a clear path to the goal line. The Ducks' comeback bid fell short this time, but the fans had caught a sneak preview of coming attractions. Guard Gary Zimmerman became Oregon's 15th All-American. I've always wanted to play pro ball, so it was a, a goal in the back of my head that I was going to do this. But also I enjoy lifting weights. I think it's a good release of stress. And uh, after studying and school work, you know, I'd come out here and relax and lift weights for a couple hours, and it just seemed to take me away from the, the hustle and bustle of the schoolwork. So, you know, I enjoyed it, and uh, consequently it paid off, you know. In the first game of the 1984 season, Oregon trailed a mediocre Long Beach State team at halftime, 17-7. Chris Miller and Tony Cherry, neither of whom had made first string, came off the bench and ignited a rally to upend Long Beach, 28-17. The Ducks went on to win three more in a row. Against Cal with the game on the line, Miller decided to go against the percentages and gamble on the big play. This waning seconds of the game when I hit Lou Barnes, you know, I went out to the huddle and I said, hey, uh, the coaches want me to throw to the fullback or the tight end in the flat or in the medium range area and set up for a field goal. But I said, you know, I'd rather not depend on a field goal and rather throw a touchdown pass and win the game. So I said, you know, hey, I'm going to look for you and beat this guy. You know, I said, go down there and put a move on him down by the goal line and I'm going to hit you. And, uh, you know, it turned out because he put a move on the guy and I saw it and threw it. He caught it and we won. And that's something, you know, that you always want to be able to do is, is tell a special athlete like Lou Barnes or somebody, hey, I'm going to be looking for you even though you're not the main guy on this route. Four big wins were followed by four close losses until Oregon met the eventual Rose Bowl contestant, UCLA. And here's a flea picker for Barnes on the reverse. He's got some room. 30, 35. The game was filled with big plays. Airs it out for Holman, and Holman has it for a touchdown. Oregon led throughout most of the game, but UCLA almost came back in the last minute. They decided to give the ball to Gaston Green on fourth and one. And held, had the Oregon Ducks, and they're going to come away with a victory here. Oregon and Washington State kicked off the 1985 season on national television. There were plenty of entertaining moments in the high-scoring 42-39 contest, but Oregon's Cherry, Barnes, and Miller proved to be too much for the Cougar RPM trio of Ripian, Porter, and Reuben Mays. My favorite game was playing Washington State. The year after Reuben Mays set the rushing record against us, he had 357. So ESPN, or TBS, WTBS it was, decided to put the game on because they figured Reuben would have a good game and we'd get demolished as we did before. But we grouped as a team and said, well, we're going to turn the tables on them and show them who's boss. So we went up to Pullman and had a great time. It was the first game of the season and we came out fired up and they were publicizing them on TV. They never gave us a commercial. They were the RPM, you know, all of this. And we didn't like it. And we were just really motivated. And I was motivated, really, really fired up. And I went out there and performed the best that I could. And their players were talking too much. And we didn't talk too much. We just performed and it just showed that we were the better team. After a heartbreaking loss to Colorado on the last play of the game, Oregon rebounded against Stanford. Tony Cherry gained 227 yards, which put him second on the all-time single-game record list. Cherry finished the season with 1,048 yards, the third Oregon running back to go over 1,000 yards in a season. Two more heart-wrenching losses, one to the Huskies and the other to Cal, where Oregon blew a 21-point lead, were hard to swallow. The Ducks found new life against the Aztecs of San Diego State as Miller passed for 368 yards and four touchdowns. The Ducks had no mercy on the Beavers at the end of the season. The game was literally filled with one big play after another, even though it was played under freezing conditions. Cherry was all Pac-10 at running back, and Chris Miller was the cream of the crop of fine Pac-10 quarterbacks. Lou Barnes repeated as first-team Pac-10 wide receiver, and in 1985 became Oregon's 16th All-American. My first touchdown was probably the most exciting, you know, to, to feeling, the best feeling that I got from scoring, because that was, you know, my first Pac-10 uh, touchdown against Ohio, you know, against Houston. And it kind of opened the game up, and we got back in the game and won it, you know, in the last, I think, the last quarter. 
So the feeling is it's always good. In 1986, the Ducks were hoping to improve on their previous 5-6 and six record, despite facing one of the toughest schedules possible. Every one of their first eight opponents finished the year playing in a bowl game. The Ducks managed to win the first two. Anthony Newman recovered a blocked punt for a touchdown to get the Ducks off on the right foot to start the season. The next week against Colorado, it was a seesaw affair. Freshman Derek Lavelle scored with 44 seconds left to play to make the score 30-29 Colorado. Oregon went for the two-point conversion to win it, but Miller's pass did not connect with Tim Parker. Oregon's only hope was a tall order. Kirk Dennis gets his kick away. It bounces high in the air. Tim Cooper has recovered for Oregon. The Ducks with new life. Miller out of the shotgun. Backpedals looking left and right. Steps up. Fires for J.J. Burton. He's open. Caught at the 27. Loses the ball. But the official says he held on. All eyes on Matt McLeod. Gary Robertson the snap. The hold by Miller. The kick by Matt from 35 is good. Oregon beats Colorado 32 to 30. The next six weeks were a severe test for the Ducks as they faced some very well-balanced teams. Oregon almost came back against USC as Chris Miller set a school record for most passes completed with 33. Going into the last three games of the season at 2-6 and six, and with no hope for a winning season, all the Ducks had left were their bruised pride. But they came through against Cal, sparked by Miller's pass to freshman Terry Obey. The victory was especially satisfying for Coach Brooks. Damn proud of you, okay? I told you I loved you last Sunday. I can't tell you how much I do. It's the greatest damn comeback after six terrifying weeks that I've ever seen. And guys, it doesn't stop here. Derek Lavelle continued to shine the next week as Oregon controlled the Cougars. The 1986 Civil War was an emotional one as the Beavers were talking like it was going to be the year to dethrone the Ducks. And they were talking how this was the year, how they were going to beat us. That was the most gratifying and satisfying win because we just crushed them and shut their mouths up. And, uh, you know, it's important not to lose with them just because of the recruiting competition and the in-state competition. Lattenberry ran for three touchdowns, showing off his speed and power. Lavelle had a great freshman year and often brought Duck fans to their feet as he does here displaying his hurtling style. Chris Miller repeated as all Pac-10 quarterback and became the first round draft choice of the Atlanta Falcons in 1987. During his career, Miller broke 13 school records, including total offense and touchdown passes. You know, a big reason why I came here was, you know, because Coach Toledo came here, Bob Toledo, uh, with a new offense and a new system, and I saw a good opportunity here. One of Miller's favorite targets, Bobby DeBishop, broke Russ Francis' school record for receptions by tight ends with 40. Mike Preacher, an all Pac-10 selection at punter, set a school record with this 78-yard punt versus Nebraska. Before the 1987 football season began, the expectations for U of O victories had seldom been lower. A schedule rated as one of the toughest in the nation, and a redshirt freshman quarterback trying to fill the shoes of Chris Miller had the experts giving Oregon two or three wins at most for the season. Coach Brooks set the tone before the season saying it was not a rebuilding year and that the young players would need to play like veterans. Freshman Bill Musgrave and sophomore Terry Obey were two who did just that in the first game at Colorado. Anthony Newman came up with some big plays as the Ducks, a 17-point underdog, stunned Colorado 10-7. 17-point-and-a-half underdogs, and yeah. we got the respect. Don't yeah. The next week, Oregon had their opportunities, but fell short against a highly rated Ohio State team. The offense and defense struggled with San Diego State, and with their backs to the wall, the Ducks drove the length of the field to overcome the Aztecs. Next were the Rose Bowl hopefuls from Seattle, before an all-time record crowd at Autzen of over 45,000 fans. The Huskies scored on their first possession, but the Ducks got everyone's attention minutes later. Musgrave, back to throw. A pump fake, want to go for long one. Oh, he's got Obi wide open as a 50. He could maybe score. He'll go to the 30. Chase from behind the 20. The 10. It's going to be touchdown, Ducks. No penalty flags. The score will stand.
The public address role is not to be a cheerleader, so you do it with voice inflection. And uh, in fact, this season, what's funny is that both USC and Washington and their coaches shows, uh, the PA announcer here has been called a homer, and I can't understand that. But anyhow, we're here to win. I mean, I'm a duck. The Ducks build up a 15-point lead late in the fourth quarter. And rolling left one to throw Musgrave. Got a man out there. Caught Lawson. 20. Turns the corner. 15. He'll go. Touchdown, Ducks! Russell Lawson! Oregon held off a late Washington comeback to beat the Huskies for the first time at Autzen since 1973. <laughs> Next came the eventual conference champion, USC Trojans. Oregon struck quickly, building up a 21-0 lead. Looking, looking, still looking, into the back of the end zone. Touchdown, Ducks! Big Jim Parker! Bill Musgrave and Terry Obey teamed up later in the game on a clutch pass and catch to seal the victory. Beat a team that I've never had the privilege of beating as a head coach. There's only two teams in the league that don't have a league loss. Only two, and we play them next week. At 4-1 and, and ranked 16th in the nation, it looked like Oregon would likely go to a bowl game. They started out well against UCLA, but later in the second quarter, the second of 25 turnovers in the next four weeks all but ended those hopes. The most frustrating game came against Stanford, as the Ducks were superior throughout 59 minutes of the game. On the last play, they went for the win instead of the tie and came within inches of winning the game. Stanford, Cal, and Arizona State were all winnable games, but with two weeks left in the season, Oregon stood at four and five. With Musgrave on the sideline with an injury, Pete Nelson led a resurgence of the Ducks offense against Washington State. The Ducks then demolished Oregon State 44 to nothing. In 1987, Kirk Dennis set a new school record for field goals with 15. Nose tackle Roland Poutier and strong safety Anthony Newman, who were instrumental in the improvement of the new 3-4 defense, were co-winners of the Hoffman Award, and both made the All-Pac-10 team. A new season attendance record was set in 1987, and a winning record was no minor accomplishment for a team dominated by young players. A new press box, sky boxes, locker rooms, and coaches' offices are scheduled to be built. Despite just missing going to a bowl game, the commitment to success points to the realistic possibility that for Duck players, coaches, and fans, their best days may still lie ahead. Over the 92 years that the University of Oregon has played football, their record is 397 wins, 371 losses, and 46 ties. A lot of credit to the winning record has to be given to the coaches. I really respect the man, and he's done a lot for the Oregon football program. Uh, he's a very competitive man, and, and one thing that kills him is losing a game, you know, or losing a, a game that you're supposed to beat the team. And, you know, he gets sick over it. Literally, he gets sick, and he's gotten better over the years. But, you know, he used to throw up before games just because he was so nervous and so intense and so competitive. And, and that's something, you know, that, that you've got to have in a head coach, and that's something he's, he has. And, uh, you know, he deserves a lot more credit than, than he gets. When I think back of my decision to go to the University of Oregon, it was one of the best decisions that I ever made in my entire life. And the reason was because of a guy by the name of Jerry Fry. He was my coach, and he was more than a coach to me. When I entered college, I was a, a young boy. And when I left, I felt like I was a mature man. And that was all because of Jerry Fry. He was a guy that that uh, taught me patience, taught me uh, all kinds of things that are more important than just playing football. I think he gave me all the ingredients that it takes to become a winner. Kaz is Oregon football uh, to me. Kaz particularly influenced me on, uh, on being both caring and demanding of his players. I think that was the key to his success. And of course, those things influence you. And of course, he was also very much involved in each player. It didn't matter whether you were good or not so good. He was involved because he had to be caring about the not so good because I wasn't any good as a player. But, but he always was there worried about me as a human being. And, and so those were great uh, examples for, for which to learn. As far as uh, uh, the 
being remembered. Uh, <laughs> I took a personal interest in the kids that I coached. In fact, uh, sometimes I'd be late for a staff meeting and and I remember John McKay used to call me Dear Abby because I'd be over uh, talking over some kid with some problem that he may have in there. And I feel that, uh, I always felt this, uh, the better I knew a kid and the better the kid knew me, the better job of coaching I could do for him. So those are the things I, I like to remember and I like to re remember too the successes that they've had in life. <laughs> Oh, 